Okay, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to today's new barn raising webinar. The focus today is uh, engaging youth. Uh, my name is Gareth Potts. Uh, I'm the guy who set up the webinar series. Uh, you probably received lots of emails from me trying to promote it. Uh, I don't really want to talk about the new barn raising concept today. I've talked about it in previous webinars. Um, I would like to draw your attention to uh, a website, the new Uh It's got lots of free resources, uh, a toolkit, articles, uh, links to the, the webinar program for this year, and also to recordings of the, 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 the past webinars. So I hope you're able to sort of find a bit of time to take a look at that at some stage. Uh, today, really, we're going to look at um, how can young people be engaged in the programming of assets? That's the, the activities that take place in and on these uh, value places and spaces uh, and then also to to ask what uh, youth can do to help sustain assets and and, and in today's concept context that means uh, you know the upkeep and repair of uh, community buildings just a quick word about the the speakers today Whitney Ross is the youth development advisor for Yolo Kali Arts Reach which is an initiative of the National Museum of Mexican Art that's located in uh, Chicago, in the Pilsen neighborhood there. Uh, Whitney is the adult lead for the Yellow Kali uh, Youth Council. And her work involves uh, a combination of design uh, and educational uh, work. Uh, and that kind of draws on her own educational background with a, with a fine arts degree in industrial design and a master's in elementary education. And both of those are from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, joining Whitney for the Q&A part of the webinar is Fabian Vasquez. Fabian is a Yolokali alumnus. He's currently studying at a liberal arts university in Chicago, Elmhurst College. He's, uh, he's studying graphic design and Spanish there. Uh, he's been involved with Yolokali for about four years now, firstly as a student and then subsequently as an intern. He, he's currently interning there this summer again. Uh, and Fabian was a founding member of the Youth Council, so he's, he's someone really well placed to, to talk about, uh, about the, the work of Yolo Kali from, from a participant uh, perspective. Uh, from the UK, Tim Redding is co-founder and director of VIY, Volunteer It Yourself, which is the focus today, obviously. Uh, he's also co-founder and director of another organization, COSPA, the co-sponsorship agency. Uh, Tim's background is in PR, sponsorship and corporate social responsibility work. And that's been in the UK, but also in Australia and South Africa. Uh, COSPA, if you don't know it, is a social innovation agency based in the UK. Does a lot of work with the private sector, with non-profits, uh, and with local and national government, all, all with the aim of developing social action. Uh, and VIY has won various awards, including uh, in 2014, it was named by the Observer newspaper, and Nesta, Nesta is a social innovation organization in the UK, as one of its 50 new radicals. So these were people and organizations that, that they, they deemed as changing Britain for the better. Uh, Tim's actually going to do the first presentation, but just before that, I'm going to play you now uh, a quick two minute video uh, that uh, outlines uh, VIY's work, in particular focusing on um, the role of its main corporate partner in VIY, which is a company called Wix. So I'm going to play that video for you now. At VIY, it's all about young people uh, volunteering to help fix up their local community centre or youth club building and in the process learning trade skills and building skills. And the scheme is very much about helping young people work towards achieving a qualification and then off the back of the project they get channelled into opportunities to progress to further training, work placements and employment. And Wix have been involved from the very start. They've been brilliant. They provide all the tools and materials for free. Uh, they also mobilise their staff and their trade customers as skills mentors who support young people on the job. Um, and that's really the heartbeat of the project. Without that support, we wouldn't be where we are now. So I've just spent this afternoon in uh, Tottenham uh, coming to see the VIY team and there's some amazing things going on here. Uh, walk through the gates and the electric nature of people doing projects, getting confidence to learn how to do not only DIY but become uh, professionals in the jobs that they've been looking at. And I think it's just a really wonderful thing to be part of. I'm so pleased that we've taken the chance to be part of 
a group that is really making a difference with young people. So excited about what I've seen today. Can't wait to see this happening in more of our schools. But it's not just the youth, you're engaging with customers, you're engaging with all different types of generations and bringing them together. And that's what's superb. So what that does for the environment you work in and for others around you, it's a great inspiration. Everybody wants to get involved and everyone likes to hear those success stories. It's great to see Wix backing and supporting a scheme that's very much about getting young people interested in learning a trade. Hi, Gareth, thank you. Uh, so, uh, yes, um, I'm probably going to uh, repeat a few things you've seen there in that video, but no harm in that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, volunteer yourself. Uh, it's very much about that idea of using uh, volunteering and social action as a platform for uh, getting young people skilled up and uh, improving their employability. Um, and uh, at the same time as improving local community buildings, and especially spaces and buildings that young people use and benefit from um, and uh, we work exclusively with 16 to 24 year olds um, many of whom are typically unemployed or not in educational training um, a lot of them are very much for, uh, drawn from disadvantaged communities a lot of young people who are um, probably turned off by conventional notions of formal learning and training um, we have a uh, about 20% of our participants probably have a, like a youth offending background. Um, interestingly, about 38% are female, uh, which is also um, something we're quite proud of because in the UK nationally, only 1% of uh, qualified tradespeople um, are female. So we're doing our bit to help reverse that. Um, all of the young people volunteer. Some of them are drawn from uh, club members uh, who use these spaces on a regular basis. Uh, some of the young people are drawn from beyond that, from among local residents. Uh, but the whole idea is that they commit time to the project, they get supported and mentored by local professional tradespeople, and over the course of volunteering, they tick off a number of skills units and work towards achieving an entry-level sitting guilds qualification, uh, which in turn provides a stepping stone to uh, progression opportunities off the back of the project, whether it be uh, plugging back into training or an apprenticeship or work placements. Um, and uh, I think a big part of the project is trying to create something that is uh, a sort of a non-formal environment. It doesn't require young people to spend any time at college. Uh, and I think that's a big draw. So uh, an important part of the project, which was probably conveyed in the video, is that we have a lot of support from the uh, business and corporate sector. And in particular, Wix, which is a key DIY retail brand in the UK. Uh, they work with both um, home consumers, people who are, who are doing those DIY tasks at home, but also local tradespeople. Um, and we essentially match up every DIY project with a local Wix store. And uh, they, they basically benefit through uh, donated tools and materials from the store. And the store also mobilizes its uh, trade customers and staff as skills mentors in support of those young people on those projects. And obviously that there is a sense of what could, what Wix can give and what they can get. And in return, the stores use VRY to uh, um, build their reputation and relationships in their community. Um, and a number of other things here, which you can see on the slide in terms of profile and footfall, um, also staff development. Um, and I think Wix will absolutely say that this is about um, doing something that's good for business, but also good for society. And they see VRY as a fundamental part of how they uh, should and could be doing business successfully and sustainably in local communities. So that's very much part of the heartbeat of the project. Um, just quickly, something about the origins of VIY. Uh, in the UK, we have about eight to 10,000 youth clubs. So um, uh, local spaces, local communities, and a lot of those suffer from funding and resource. Um, and um, um, through the course of our work, we've encountered many clubs that are really battling to save their club, uh, often linked to the need to make physical repairs to their clubs. Um, so that was something which motivated us to try and find a way of, of, of helping them. Um, coupled with that, uh, we also um, were very much aware that in the UK, there's an ongoing challenge around um, what's described as a skills vacuum for vocational trades. So um, there are 
plummeting numbers of um, plasterers, electricians, plumbers um, in the UK. Uh, the average age of a tradesperson in the UK is uh, nudging 50, remarkably now. Um, and at the same time, people say that young people are not being attracted to learning these skills at school or college, and indeed are not um, uh, not being given the chance to do so. There's a falling number of apprenticeships as well in this sector. So combining those two challenges about spaces in need and young people not having a chance to learn these skills, um, our aim was to say, OK, well, is there a way in which we can bring those two things together? Um, and I just wanted to visually show a couple of examples here of what these projects look like. Um, that, that, that they are very broad in terms of the skills that people um, learn and apply. And it is everything from painting and decorating through to plastering, tiling, plumbing, joinery and carpentry, brickwork. Um, and it's a mix of internal and external work. Uh, here's a club in Birmingham, um, which uh, is a boxing club. They had struggled to... Um, retain young people and to join a local boxing league because they didn't have any decent changing facilities, showers, toilets. So the young people at the club wanted our help in basically um, turning around their club and putting in showers, putting in decent toilets and changing facilities. And you can see here over the course of a couple of months what they achieved, um, supported by local tradespeople. Uh, another example is we work with the Sea Cadets group in East London. Um, they had a very grotty community hall uh, which they were making use of, and it was fairly typical that the main club space was very run down, very shabby. They had issues with the floor, issues with the roof, um, looked very shabby, and they wanted to do something about that. And again, over the course of six weeks, they worked with us to completely revitalise that main club space. We also did their kitchens, toilets, some external work as well. But that's fairly typical of many of the types of buildings that we work with that have problems with the fabric, uh, floors, walls and ceilings. Um, another example here uh, is a club where they had a leaking roof, which is often um, uh, very damaging. Water gets in, destroys the interior of the building, can destroy equipment. Um, if the building's not waterproof, as I say, all manner of problems ensue. And so uh, we spent a lot of time and effort working exclusively on their roof. Um, we had to uh, be very conscious of health and safety, working at heights, special training, uh, refelted the entire roof. Uh, fantastically uh, involving and quite complex and quite challenging. And people went from zero to the end of an eight-week project being uh, incredibly adept at this. Um, so it was quite a ranging um, uh, mix of jobs and tasks which people are keen to take on. Often, uh, often we're quite amazed at how ambitious and uh, how much appetite young people have for uh, taking on these jobs and identifying what they're trying to achieve with our help. Um, so hopefully that gives you a bit of a taste and flavour about what the project's about and what the projects look like. Um, partly what I'm keen to talk about is the nature of the partnerships which underpin the project. And um, I think Gareth made an interesting point in discussions a while back around the idea of if we had unlimited funding, uh, would something like BRY still be needed? You know, would these clubs still need the same help? And, and actually, there's something really um, vital about uh, what, what these organisations and partners bring to the project other than cash. And often, I think it's those assets, it's the people, it's the places, it's the products which organisations can contribute, which often enable the project and make it happen in the way that pure money can't. Um, so so our, our background and VRY was born out of trying to look at where the common agenda sits for um, brands and corporates, for non-profits and community groups, and also national and local government. And, and I guess in a way it's trying to spot that common agenda. Everyone's trying to find ways of engaging with young people um, and trying to understand, well, how might these organisations, you perhaps have a disparate view of things, pull together to achieve something that n none of them working in isolation could achieve. Um, and I think that's kind of represented by a couple of slides I've done here, which um, uh, I kind of call this the value exchange, because I think people say to me, well, what's the one tip that I might pass on about what the journey we've been through in starting and growing VRY? And I think it does come down to that notion of, um, uh, you, know, you know, who's involved, what they bring, what they get from the project, and, and why that sense of we can give this and we get that, that, that drives their commitment and it drives their passion for the project. And it ensures that these partners stick and really stay and grow with the project. Um, and, and, and so in terms of that value exchange, each, each of these organizations can bring something unique 
to the um, pot. Um, starting at the top, uh, UK Youth is one of the big uh, youth bodies in the UK. They have a network of um, 8,000 youth clubs and groups around the country. They very much help us identify projects and recruit and support young people on those projects. Uh, Wix we've touched on, um, they put their hand up and provide those tools and materials, but also perhaps more importantly, um, their customers and staff as mentors on those projects, also volunteers, of course. Sitting Guilds, um, you may know them, they're the world's largest skills body. Um, they provide us in kind our skills accreditation framework and a bespoke qualification which young people work towards. And that is um, uh, something special for VLY. As I say, it doesn't involve any college time. It's very much about learning and being assessed on the job, on the task in hand. Um, and people over the course of a standard VLY project end up with an entry level sitting gills level three in building and construction skills, which is a great stepping stone into um, pathways off the back of the project. Um, Nesta and the Big Lottery Fund are two big funders of social action in the UK. Um, and I think what's interesting that they're really looking for um, providing support that matches and helps maybe uh, attract funding from the private sector. So of course, for every pound that we attract in value from Wix and sitting guilds, um, Nestor and Big Lottery Fund, in a sense, are giving us perhaps two or three pounds to match that. So it's a really important um, kind of opportunity to bring horses to water um, because of the private sector involvement in turn attracts that match funding. Um, and then the, the, the kind of final stakeholder group are uh, employers and building contractors, um, often local to our projects on the ground, who um, can provide those follow on opportunities for young people to say, look, if you've done this, if you've got something out of it, you want to do more, we can plug you into that. So it's a really important of the process from start to finish. Um, and then on the flip side, um, what people get and for the youth sector, they're absolutely trying to create um, employability opportunities for young people and to build capacity in their clubs and groups. Uh, Wix, as I've mentioned, they want to build their relationships with their trade customers, engage their staff, develop their staff. Sitting guilds want to get more people working towards a sitting guilds uh, accreditation. Uh, those uh, grant giving bodies desperately keen to work more with the private sector. And finally, those employers, again, um, need help perhaps um, engaging with young people who are work ready and can move into apprenticeship opportunities and in doing so help them um, deliver against their objectives in working with local authorities on public sector contracts. So that's the kind of value exchange which I often talk about um, which drives the ROI. Uh, so um, just, just a few numbers for you to give you a sense of scale. We started out three and a half years ago in South London uh, with uh, two youth club buildings. Um, now we've done 80 projects around the UK. We're doing another um, 75 or so over the next year. Um, so we're building, of course, we're scratching at the service and for every club that we work with, there's probably um, three youth clubs or groups uh, that we currently can't work with. So we, we, so we are desperately keen to drive uh, capacity and to build our capacity. Um, it's probably fair to say that a lot of those clubs, as I perhaps mentioned earlier, um, this isn't about nice to do work. It is often about essential repair and refurbishment, uh, which again, I think gives these projects a sense of purpose and edge, uh, which you perhaps don't find in formal education. Uh, we've worked with about one and a half thousand um, young people um, uh, across all of our projects. Um, as I say, um, 16 to 24 is our sweet spot. We probably have had a few people who have been 14 to 16 and keen to uh, um, engage as well. Uh, of those, about 1,100, about 75% or so, um, have successfully stayed with those projects and emerged or graduated with a, uh, a vocational uh, qualification at the end of it, which is tremendous. Um, we've had about 350 uh, trace people now who have volunteered as, on projects. Many of them have uh, been repeat volunteers on multiple projects. Um, and then uh, perhaps most importantly, at the end of it all, we've had about 300 young people who have directly progressed off the back of their VOI experience um, onto a uh, work placement, an apprenticeship, or perhaps even a self-employment opportunity. Um, and indeed, we do have young people who set themselves up in business as local sort of painters and decorators for a perhaps on local contracts with um, housing associations, which is tremendous. 
So, so that's kind of a snapshot uh, where we've got to in the UK. We've been lucky enough to attract a few awards. Gareth mentioned the New Radicals Award, which has helped our profile. Um, uh, we've had a Prime Minister's Big Society Awards. And as much as it's great to see the social outcomes of VOI recognised, I'm also pleased to see um, the kind of business benefits and the way that we're working with the business community uh, also recognised, such as through the Corporate Engagement Awards. Um, uh, because I think it's very much that whole idea of good for business, good for society, which is, again, fundamental to VOI. Um, within the UK, our challenges, um, uh, I, I think, have revolved around how we set up VOI in a way that it's better able to um, attract and generate income, to make it less dependent on grant funding, how we build our capacity to support more projects, um, uh, and also how we diversify some of the ways in which we um, spark and commission and adopt projects. Um, and for example, a lot of that is about how we link into uh, wider training and employment and community regeneration agendas in local authorities, um, perhaps also with um, the whole building sector and the construction sector. Um, conscious of time, so I'd better keep moving on. Um, I wanted to also uh, just say a few words, conscious of you know, people looking in today uh, from beyond the UK. And very much part of our ambition is to how we start to package up VOI in a way that might provide a model for replicating this type of activity in other markets um, in Europe and beyond. Um, in particular, we're working with um, a, a couple of organizations in Europe uh, uh, with a proposal to the EU about how we might work with the DIY retail sector more broadly. Um, and there's two organizations, EDRA and FEDIMA, who are partnering with us along with sitting guilds to do that. And we're in the process or on the cusp of hosting a debate at the EU about plugging all of this into the wider pan-European uh, youth employment initiative. So we're, we're hoping to um, pilot VOI in maybe three or four other EU member states over the coming 18 months or so. Um, also to add, uh, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, um, this idea of a skills vacuum in the sector and why VOI is ultimately um, channeling young people into a sector where there are jobs. Um, it's not just a UK thing. Um, in the EU now, uh, for every um, uh, three tradespeople who are retiring from the sector, only one young person is entering the sector. And also the average age of a qualified uh, tradesperson is over 45. Um, these figures have been revealed by Manpower. And um, again, it tells you that there's a common agenda around youth uh, employability and vocational trades and perhaps promoting those as very um, worthwhile, valuable job and career pathways. I know in Britain, there's always been a, a struggle, perhaps, to um, have vocational skills recognized as um, something worthwhile and um, versus channeling young people always through to higher education or further education. So I think VOI is doing its bit in that respect as well about trying to uh, be a bit of a champion for trade skills and making them attractive and appealing to young people. Um, I think I'm nudging my uh, time, allotted time here. So um, probably time to finish up and um, just say that really off, off the back of our interest in looking at exploring opportunities for um, uh, replicating or um, extending the VOI model, I'm very open to hearing from people perhaps who may wish to nominate projects, whether in the UK and beyond, or perhaps are interested in looking at how we might spark and start um, a, a new program of projects uh, in other markets. Um, my details are here. I'm sure this will be shared, um, but I'll stop there. Hopefully that's given you a decent flavor uh, of where we've come from and um, some, of the, some of the challenges and opportunities that we've um, encountered and uh, uh, worked with over our time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tim. That was great. Uh, probably one of the one of the projects that, that feature in the webinars that really does kind of chime with with the barn raising uh, kind of metaphor that, that underpins the the webinar series. Um, love the fact that it really you know overlaps with the the, the Wix uh, the company's kind of core 
activities really sort of you know in, um, integrally linked with uh, with those. I thought your value exchange slides are you know, applicable to probably every project and program that um, that uh, sort of participates in the webinar series. And I'm also not aware of any uh, like uh, VIY in uh, North America, certainly in the US, and I think also in Canada. So hopefully there'll be some some opportunities and some 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 interest in terms of replicating it. Okay, so without further ado, now I'm going to pass you over to the. Yola Kali team to, to Whitney in Chicago. Hi, um, so I'm going to be talking about Yola Kali. We are um, a youth initiative of the National Museum of Mexican Art, which is located in Chicago. Uh, Yola Kali is a word from the Nahuatl language, an Aztec language. Uh, it means heart of the house. Just some background for you guys. Uh, our mission is to create an experiential learning environment um, where we can encourage youth to work on their own ideas and projects, and we really focus on urban and youth culture. Since 1997, we have offered free art programming and youth development to teens and young adults. Um, although we are associated with the museum, we are not in their building. We're located about a mile away from them. Um, we also plan community events like workshops and video screenings, um, and we also hold exhibitions at the end of every uh, semester, art semester, um, and we obviously promote that we're a safe, constructive, and supervised atmosphere. We're also an open community center. Uh, when we don't have classes in session, people can come in. We, we really gear our space towards teens, obviously, but they can come in and use our studio space, our computer labs. We have a library. Um, sometimes people come to just hang out. Our, our goal with Yolo Kali is to really be, um, there's this idea in city planning of third spaces. Adults have third spaces like cafes or bars. Your first space is home, your second space is work. Um, for teens, it's home and school. Um, and adults have third spaces where they can kind of hang out. Um, it's a space where you can, uh, it's an anchor of the community. It's a space where you're supposed to foster interaction and, and people can feel comfortable just kind of hanging out there. And teams don't really have these third spaces. So that's sort of our goal with Yolo Kali, that we're a space where kids can feel comfortable. They can come, hang out. We're always there. Um, it's kind of a no-pressure situation, um, just a positive environment. Um, in 2009, we, we won the highest honor for out-of-school arts programs, which was the National Arts and Humanities Program Award um, for our creativity. Uh, some of the things we've made, we're, we're really known in the neighborhood for our murals. We have over 30, I believe 30, 35 murals. Uh, this is a map um, you can find on our website uh, if you're in Chicago with just some of the local murals. We also do photo and video classes. We've done zine and comic making. We had a recycled art class. We partnered with Nike for some shoe painting. And last summer, we did a skateboard design class. We really, and these are just examples to show that we really try to focus on youth interests and um, keep it interesting, keep it different. We also have a journalism program. Uh, that will be having um, some of their programming on the radio here in Chicago. You can find more of all of these things, obviously, at Facebook and Instagram. Um, we have our crazy videos on Vimeo, and our journalism program has a sound cloud and a Tumblr where you can hear audio stories, read um, written stories. They're going to have podcasts up there, um, some soundscapes. Um, and so, so within Yolo Kali, we have uh, our youth council developed um, out, of, out of a group of students um, who just kind of want, we want them to be a big part of how we make decisions at Yolo Kali. Our mission is to represent the youth voice uh, in our organization by planning classes. We've even had some of our youth council members read resumes and conduct interviews and ultimately hire some of our teaching artists. Uh, they're in charge of special events, writing grants, 
planning um, and promoting special programs and community events. And the whole purpose of our youth council was to bridge the gap between our staff and the young people we serve. Ultimately, um, we work for them. Uh, so we want to keep all of our classes and all of our special events and workshops and everything geared towards them. This is, this is their third space, right? This is their home. We want this to be for them. So we created our youth council. And it ended up having, of course, reciprocal benefits. Um, it keeps our organization um, stuck on our mission of student-centered programming. But it also gives youth opportunities to be leaders to um, become engaged members of the organization, and we hope ultimately the community. Um, these are wonderful leadership opportunities that they have, and we hope that we can they can take them and, and move them forward when they when they move on from Yolo Kali. So uh, we began in 2012, um, really casually. Some kids would kind of stay after class and hang out and come up with some ideas of things that they wanted to do. Initially, I had a student approach me about wanting to host movie nights in our space. And I said, all right, let's make this happen. How can we do this? And we researched online, and we found uh, a grant geared towards young people. So we met, and together we wrote out this grant. We applied for it, and we won. Um, not a ton of money, but for them a lot. Uh, and we were able to put on this movie night. And from there, it just became more of a serious thing. Um, once kids found out this was happening, more and more started to meet with us and hang out. Um, and so we applied as a, an org, Yolo Kali applied for um, a larger grant to really formalize our council. Um, and so this included researching, um, developing an infrastructure, and then creating a guidebook, which I'll share a little bit more about at the end. Um, so we, we started to meet and really meet formally and talk about how we wanted this to look. We looked at how other councils um, worked. Uh, many had appointing officers, like standard youth council president, vice president. Um, some other local arts organizations had time commitments, where you had to come every single week or you weren't part of it. Um, some had age limits, where you could only be in high school. Also, there were limits for group size. You know, it, obviously, councils work a little better when they're kind of smaller. Um, but our group talked about all of this, and we, we created our mission statement together. And when it came time to formalize all of these, these infrastructural decisions, they vetoed everything. They didn't want to do any of that. Um, and I joked that chaos ensued. Um, but no, it didn't. It actually it works out great uh, with, with very few rules, um, which is how teens prefer to function. And especially with this idea of third space, where we want this no pressure, fun situation. Um, our teens come. The committed teens stick around. They come to the meetings. And we work together. And, and we complete projects. Uh, so it ends up actually being, it's, it's been really successful so far. Um, over the course of a couple of years, we have found that there are some formalities that have helped us. Um, for starters, we do meet weekly. We initially met every other week, and it just wasn't quite enough time. Um, so now we do meet weekly. Every Friday, the kids know they can come and hang out, and we can talk about whatever we're working on, and we can do fun projects, and we're here. But they're not absolutely required to come in order to be in the council. I will say that 99% of the time, they are all here, which is amazing. Um, we also found that, obviously, communication is key. We created a private Facebook group um, that we're all members of. And we can share, we can create events so that kids are reminded of special events when we're meeting um, or projects that we're working on. We can share ideas and keep everyone informed. So maybe that they weren't able to attend the last meeting, but they can go on the Facebook group and see what they missed and, and still be involved. Um, also, this is great for kids who are away at college who are um, a little bit older. They're part of the council, sort of, but they can't be here for every meeting. But they want to be a part of the things that we do. So they can provide their input via the Facebook group, which is really great to keep everyone involved. It's also been a great way to build relationships with them. You know, we share silly things, too, and we kind of razz each other, you know, give each other kind of a hard time. Um, and I think that's a, an important 
um, way of building relationships with teens is kind of this is their realm. Um, so to be able to do that is, has been really helpful. Um, food. If you have it, they will come. We almost, when we first started, that was kind of a, one of the ways to get people in the door to find out what the youth council was about, the promise of snacks. <laughs> and they come running. Um, and it's silly, but it's true. It really, if you can get them in the door and show that you're doing a cool thing, they'll stick around. Um, and lastly, our youth council is volunteer-based. They don't get paid to be a part of the program. Uh, they come on their own fruition. Uh, but we do try to give them some incentives um, in addition to the snacks uh, to, to kind of say thank you for all the things that they do because they really do a lot of hard work in the council. Um, because we're affiliated with the National Museum of Mexican Art, we are able to give them special museum privileges. They get a museum ID which allows them to get into any other museum in the city of Chicago for free, which is a huge incentive for them. They all really love that. Um, they also, in the city of Chicago, if you're in a public high school, you're required to do a certain number of volunteer hours each semester. So I give them volunteer hours for the projects that they do. Um, and they also get real work experiences. They have deadlines. They have to communicate. They have to work together. They have to be leaders. So this is really like an intern-like work experience that I encourage them to put on their resume. So here's some of the projects that we've done. I'll go through these pretty quickly um, just to give you an idea of some of the craziness that we do. Um, we submitted an idea for a clean graffiti, and we won a grant for $1,000 um, to power wash sidewalks with positive messages in our neighborhood. So we were able to do this uh, around uh, where we're located. Um, we're partnered with the um, Chicago Department of Public Health and we have, uh, we receive free condoms from them. So every year we host a Valentine's Day party where kids can come and make Valentine's for their friends, eat pizza, and kind of in a stigma-free environment, receive free condoms and information to make informed, healthy decisions. Um, we do have condoms in our building all year round, but the Valentine's Day condom party is kind of more of a fun way to, to promote that we have them. This is just a silly Valentine that they made. Um, we were approached by the, by the Cubs, which is the baseball team in Chicago, to celebrate their Wrigley Field's anniversary, yeah, the Wrigley Field anniversary, um, their 100th year. And they tasked us with designing a set of stadium chairs in the theme of soccer. So we were able to paint and um, add all this craziness, the horns and the, the soccer balls. And then they actually displayed the chairs out in the city for a couple of months. And then they were auctioned off for $700, which is really amazing. So obviously the council got some of that money to purport towards future projects. Um, we also do free workshops in the community. We'll do things at uh, block parties and things like that where we'll do face painting or anything free to engage the community and let them know about Yolo Kali and what we do. This was something that the, the team created. They hosted. They taught the class. They did everything. Um, it was a wheat pasting workshop, so they kind of shared their love of street art with, with the community and taught them how to make drawings on paper and paste them up around the neighborhood. Most recently, we've done a, uh, we were commissioned to create a large scale work of art uh, for a local law office. They wanted some textile art, and they knew, they'd heard about us through a couple of our other projects and wanted something interesting from us. So we submitted a few ideas, and they um, chose our string installation, which not only mimics the Chicago flag, but also the Chicago skyline and its shape at the bottom. So we were um, provided a stipend, and, and the kids were able to work on this from beginning to end and create a budget and an idea and, and a plan, and they worked through it, which was, a, was really fun to see. Um, we were also part of a local music fest this summer. We had live painting from some of our teachers and students as well as some of our alumni. They did graffiti painting. Uh, we also sold some merch. Our journalism students were allowed to go there as press, 
which was a great opportunity for them for their podcast and, and radio show. They'll be talking about it soon. Um, we blew up our coloring book pages for people to come and interact with. And these were all ideas of our youth council. They, they created all of this. We sold merch as well. Our coloring book is one of the things that we sell. So that was something fun to see it, it blown up really big. Um, and the big event that our youth council does every year is our, we called it our chill set, which was just our teen night at the museum. It was totally free. The kids uh, contacted restaurants and other organizations and a DJ and got everything donated. So we were able to provide music and dancing and food and free workshops and everything was, was geared towards kids 14 to 24, so also the college age. Um, the museum ca it closes a little bit early, so a lot of kids don't often get to experience the museum. So this was a fun way for them to go and, and see all the exhibits, see everything for free. And uh, like I said, we had free workshops. They could get their face painted like Day of the Dead. They could make a button, draw, and then we had dancing and music, and it was all free. So this will be a thing we do yearly. Um, and last year we had over 300 people attend, so it was really successful. Um, and we had, last weekend we had a crazy tie-dye water balloon fight. This was another, um, the local park district had a, I had a call for, um, they were providing grants to engage people in the community at their local park. And they contacted us and said that they really wanted teens to be more involved. And so our youth council submitted an idea for a tie-dye water balloon fight, which was insane, but really super fun. We spent three days filling over 3,000 water balloons with tinted water and just had a wild, crazy water balloon fight. Um, and this is just an example of some of the, the craziness that, that we do here at YOLO. Um, so as I mentioned, um, funding, we, uh, we write grants often for different things. And this is really, obviously, like I said, this is a, a good experience for teens to see how the grant process works. They have to have an idea. They have to be able to say it in words. And they have to be able to present it to other people. So doing that whole process with them is really important. Um, but addition, in addition to writing grants, we also make and sell handmade merchandise with uh, artwork that the kids make. Um, so we have our coloring book. We also make sketchbooks, buttons, stickers. And because we're an arts organization, we have all the things to make this possible. Um, it's really easy for us to make these in-house, um, fold paper, staple, flip, print them, make them look good. And, and it's easy for us to make a, a, a pretty good profit. Uh, after every semester of class, we have a, an exhibition, a gallery exhibition for all the students. And we started selling our goods here. And they were really successful. And so we started applying for our local fairs and block parties. And now we sell um, all summer long at, at different locations and, and even a few things in the winter. Um, but the, it's, I think this is really important for the young people to see the whole fundraising process, that they have to put money forward, make a product that people want to buy, and then go out there and sell it to make money. And I try to really make the... Uh, budget transparent. I let them see how much it costs to make something and the work it takes to make it and, and how we have to go and apply for these craft fairs to be able to sell so that we can make our council self-sufficient, so that we can do all these silly projects that we want to do. Um, it's not all fun and games. We do have to have to work to make this happen and, and they're a part of all of that process, which is really important. Um, so because of the success of our merchandise, our council um, proposed an online store to the museum. And we're actually working on that. And it should be up this fall. So if you're interested in buying our coloring book or our sketchbook, they make a great gift. Um, and it'll be online this fall, which is really exciting. So obviously, getting to this point took uh, some trial and error. But we did learn a lot about creating a council. And so we created a guidebook that is free. It's on issue. Um, issue.com slash Yolo So you can read our guidebook about if you're interested in creating a council, kind of how to begin and where to go and some of the questions to ask yourself to get there. So you can find that there. And that's it. Thank you.
Okay, uh, thanks very much, Whitney. Uh, there were a few things that, that stood out, I thought, in your presentation. Uh, perhaps the most important thing for me is that, that um, Yolo Kali isn't just uh, a case of the, the National Museum of Mexican Art trying to set up a, an organization to, to encourage kids to, to come through the museum's own doors. It's actually uh, the museum almost like taking on an extra arm or limb, if you like, to, to sort of do things differently, to, to make sure that they've got a very sort of youth-centric culture. Um, and I also thought it was very interesting that the, the, the kids that take part uh, are getting an awareness not just of art and, and also just having good fun. They're actually also becoming aware of, uh, you know, non-profits and how those operate. So you're also sort of strengthening civil society more generally. Okay, uh, we've got time for some questions now. Uh, First of all, uh, I'd like to go to Fabian, however, who's uh, been listening very patiently. Uh, Fabian, uh, could you maybe uh, say a little bit about uh, your involvement in Yolo Kali, uh, kind of it, what you see as its impact, what it's, what it's done for you personally, your own personal involvement with it? Uh, just, just a bit about your own kind of, kind of uh, perspective on things, please. Yeah, um, well... I was there when it first started, and then seeing it, what it, what it, is, and seeing what it is now, it's like mind blowing. Because now we have, now we have a lot more people than we started with, and we see a lot of more youth like getting active in the, in the process of the whole youth council, and then actually noticing like people learn how to ask for grants and look for grants, and actually executing the whole idea that where it starts from to actually doing the main event and it's just it's just mind-blowing so. so I first started at Yolo Kali when I was in high in high school and I started as a student and I took some classes here at Yolo Kali and I was one of those people that would like hang around after the class and like talk to the staff and get to know them a lot more and then from there after I graduated high school uh, I wasn't able to take um, Yolo, I wasn't take, able to take classes at Yolo Kali anymore because it's only for like high school students. So then I sticked around and I went from being a student here to being a like an intern and I helped around with uh, the classes and actually like getting the intern work done. Um, I taught a, thing, a silk screening class with the help of another teaching artist, so that like that really helped a lot. And, um, that gave me like a lot of not only it gave me experience in teaching a class and helping like the students and how to actually teach them what I know. Um, that helped me a lot in college. Uh, that was in order for my major. That was one of the classes I needed to take, and because. I was there, I entered with experience and I told my teachers about that. I was able to skip to like upper level classes and like actually showed them what I had learned at Yolo Kali. So that was pretty cool. Okay, thanks Fabian. That's great. Um, let's move on with some more questions now. I've got a question here for, for Tim. Uh, do the trainees have to be involved with, i.e. using or members of the the centers and buildings uh, do they get involved in these organizations subsequently probably about half of the young people uh, that we work with um, are members or current users of those youth spaces um, and uh, the other half are often drawn from the kind of wider local community and uh, some of them are referenced in via local job centers or youth defending teams um, or find out about us in local press um, so it's a bit of a mix, but I think what we do find is that a lot of the young people who weren't previously involved with those spaces end up uh, remaining involved on an ongoing basis. So uh, I think it's good for the clubs and their youth groups to help uh, kind of reach out and um, get to know and include more people in their communities. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, just another quick question here whilst, whilst, whilst you're there. Uh, how do does, how does centres apply to be part of the scheme? So if, if, if uh, there's a sort of community centre or a youth, youth club, how, how would they go about getting in touch with you and getting involved in this? Uh, on the uh, Volunteer It Yourself website, uh, the um, uh, web address is at the end of the presentation. There's um, details for um, how to um, send an email and to tell us something about your club or your group and what you're trying to do. Uh, we have a, uh, a fairly um, succinct list of uh, 
fundamental criteria in the way in which we kind of assess whether a project is right for us and we're in a position to help. And that might be about understanding um, uh, what the kind of building task is to hand and what young people want to do yeah. um, to understand uh, the types of young people uh, that club or group might be working with or trying to reach out to, um, understanding timescales, timelines, things like that. Uh, also, whether we're able to match it readily with uh, some of that local WIC store support or um, uh, local contractor, building contractor relationships. So there's a few things we look for to make sure that the project is genuinely meeting a need and uh, fits well with what we're trying to do. Great. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, we've got a question here for Yola Kali on outreach. How do youth council members slash Yola Kali reach out to the whole community, including non-Latinos? What are the techniques for making sure everybody knows about your work and feels welcome with you? Um... That's, uh, we usually try to stay within our neighborhood and where we're located. So we do reach out to the community, but we are involved in lots of different community yeah. events. So if there's something happening in our neighborhood, we usually try to find out about yeah. it and be a part of it. Um, I don't know if we necessarily are specifically trying to engage a certain type of people, like Latino or non-Latino. Um, it's really just about the neighborhood that we're in or um, if, if we're um, putting up a mural, uh, we try to engage that area in things. But I don't think we're specific about who we're, we're reaching. It's just more yeah. about where they're located um, to let them know that we're here. It's usually we try to tie it back into letting people know that we're here and we're around. We, we moved into a new building three years ago. Um, and so it, we're still sort of trying to get the word out that, that we're here, yeah. that we're in this space. Um, so I don't know if that necessarily answers the question, but um, we, we definitely uh, are connected with uh, some of the government agencies in the neighborhood, the schools, um, some of the other nonprofits. And so if an event is happening, we're, we're, yeah. we're usually there. Okay, thank you. And there's another, another question for, for uh, Yola Kali is, um, are there any examples of young people graduating to involvement in the main museum, volunteers, visitors, employees? And I know you mentioned they have the museum pass and the, the chill set, so that sounded very interesting. But I guess any kind of kind of deeper involvement once maybe they've graduated to, to, to involvement with the main National Museum of Mexican Art? Yeah, we've had several kids move on from our program and become interns at the museum, yeah. paid interns. Uh, we've had a few alumni go and work at the museum. Um, the museum also does local neighborhood mural tours. We've had our young people um, have an internship, I believe, last summer, maybe two summers ago, um, provide bike tours for museum goers to go and bike around and, and see a, a right. lot of the murals okay. in the neighborhood. Um, so yeah, we, we always push them in that direction if yeah. it's something that they're interested in, um, if they're interested in working for our museum. Okay, thanks Whitney. Uh, another question for Tim. Uh, you mentioned retirement amongst skilled professionals. Are retirees involved as volunteers? Uh, yes, increasingly so actually. I think something about 30% um, of our trade mentors are semi-retired or retired. And, and, and we definitely have situations where we have uh, a 17 year old working alongside a 70 year old um, so that sort of intergenerational um, piece is really important um, in fact many of the youth clubs are based in community centers which are perhaps a youth club on a Tuesday or a Thursday or a Saturday night and then at other times in the week they're used by other audiences and uh, so we actually stumbled across uh, retired tradespeople who were part of a, uh, a senior citizens tea dance um, on um, on another day, and they heard about what the young people were doing to their building. And said, "Well, you know, I've got 40 years' experience in uh, um, this area. I'd love to help out." So it kind of happened by chance. But now we kind of purposefully look out for and try and get uh, semi-retired and retired folk involved. Perhaps also the value is they've got time to uh, commit, uh, which sometimes people who are fully employed don't yeah. always have. So, okay, uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, question for Whitney. 
Uh, does any of the Yolokali artwork produced make it into the National Museum of Mexican Art? A couple of years ago, we did have one of the main um, galleries within the museum showcasing our student artwork. Um, one of the big funders for our program, the founding member had passed away, so we did an entire gallery dedicated to her, um, which, which featured all student artwork from Yolokali, which was really exciting. Um, in order to get our galleries, um, within the museum or just small little exhibitions or showcases, not main galleries. So it is a fairly small museum, just so you know. <laughs> There's not a ton of room. So. Thanks, Whitney. Uh, I think we'd better make this the final question here. Uh, it's for Tim. Are these buildings local authority owned and or managed? If so, are there any objections from unions or staff to volunteer work? Tim? It, it, it's a good question. I'm glad to say it hasn't been an issue for us to date. Um, uh, probably most of the clubs and groups we work with are independent, so they might um, own their own building, um, but they just don't have the resource to effectively maintain it. Um, that's sadly a common um, um, story. Uh, we do work with um, a small number of council-owned um, club buildings and community centres, they might be multi-purpose or multi-use perhaps. Um, I, I think from, um, uh, in terms of the kind of council perspective, uh, if we are working on a council-owned um, property or building, I think they always enter into it thinking, well, this is a chance to maybe find a better way of um, delivering a public service outcome in terms of the ongoing uh, management of um, community facilities and uh, both in terms of uh, physically managing and maintaining them but also generating those wider outcomes of community engagement, community enablement. Um, so local authorities um, uh, are always I think very positive about the idea of um, helping them to uh, improve and maintain their own stock of community buildings um, and um, I think uh, again also at times working um, uh, on those council-owned properties, the uh, contractors who they might otherwise turn to to help carry out uh, physical improvements, uh, they also, uh, I think, are warm to it because it, they treat these projects as a way of um, uh, them being able to demonstrate to councils that they are uh, delivering against um, community engagement and youth employment um, objectives, which they often have to meet as part of uh, council contracts. So uh, it's it's in everyone's favour to do this. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, the BOI has been accepted. I think that there's a bit of a classic win-win. Um, um, so uh, as yet, we've had no trouble with that whole idea of people volunteering. I should also say that um, it doesn't impinge upon young people who are perhaps um, unemployed, claiming unemployment benefit. Um, it is a volunteering piece. It lasts for typically six to eight weeks. That doesn't stop people um, accessing uh, unemployment uh, benefit when they're taking part. Okay, uh, I think we better call it a day there. Um, I'd like to thank the speakers, uh, Whitney and Fabian in Chicago, and uh, Tim in the UK. Uh, thanks also to you for listening. Uh,